Good morning and happy Sabbath. The National Anthem. Why do we stand for the National Anthem? Why do we place our hand over our heart for the National Anthem? <clears throat> if we are outside at a sporting event in the National Anthem place, we remove our hats. Why do we do that? Why do we remove our hats for the National Anthem? And why do we remain silent other than maybe you sing the song that's behind the National Anthem, you remain silent during the National Anthem? Why is this? Why does this happen when this song is played? Well, we do it in honor. We do it in respect or out of respect for the freedoms that we have in this country. For the men who died and the women who have died for our freedoms. That's why we do this. We do it out of pride. We are proud to be American citizens. We are proud to have this song played. We also do it because about 1931, when the national anthem was taken by Congress as the national song, we have been instructed that this is what takes place when the national anthem is played. If you ever went to school, your school teacher taught you to stand, place your hand over your heart, as the national anthem was played. We've been instructed from a young age that this is what we do when our song is played for the United States of America. We do that out of pride, respect, and honor. Bow your heads with me this morning before we begin the sermon. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this Sabbath day. We want to thank you for the freedoms of this country, freedom to worship you. Lord, we do honor and respect the flag that flies for our freedom. But we also want to show respect and honor to you also, Lord, today as we have come here to church to worship. And we thank you for, for the freedom. We thank you for this warm building that you have given us to worship in. Ask that each one here would gain a blessing from what uh, you have laid upon my heart. In your name, amen. <clears throat> well, I was glad to see that there's some, uh, some young people here today. Back in Wilson, we have probably about 30 that come up for children's story. But uh, I know young people love... Do you know what these are? What about you, young man? You know what this is? What's this made out of? You know what this is made out of? Do you have some of those at home? Yeah, Legos? You like, you like Legos? Yeah, I, like, I, I grew up... Uh, putting Legos together, and I like Legos too. Now, this is the instruction manual for putting this Lego truck together. My son put this together. He's uh, 23 now, and it sits in his bedroom uh, on his dresser. And in two weeks, he's gonna start driving one because he just got a job and it's going to be driving a semi from Rochester to Nina, Wisconsin. So he, he just got a job. But he put this together, and I'm pretty sure he couldn't have put this together without the instruction manual. There's 64 pages in this instruction manual that he went through piece by piece to create this Lego semi truck. Um, now, he was pretty creative. I've seen him build snowmobiles. I've seen him build little tractors. But typically, they didn't have the detail that this truck has because he wouldn't follow the instructions. He just took his creative mind, and he would make his own structure out of his Legos. But if he really wanted something to look fantastic, he would follow the instruction manual. And I don't think that there's anybody here today, if we tore this apart and set it on the floor, that could put it together without this instruction manual. There's too many pieces, too many parts, and uh, 
you would need this booklet to put this together and make it look the same way. So the instruction manual is very, very important. I think of a, a story in the Bible where God instructed somebody to build something similar to this, only it was much larger. And that's Noah. And if you would turn to Genesis 6.14 with me. We're going to see the instructions that God gave to Noah. I'm going to read four, start in 14. It says, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. What was God saying there? Did he say, Make it of oak? So make it of cedar? Did he say, Make it of uh, ash? Pine? He was specific in his instructions. He said, Make it of gopher wood. Okay? It says, Make rooms in the ark. So he wanted rooms made throughout the ark for some reason. At this point, maybe Noah didn't know why he needed rooms. You know, God was giving him instruction, but he, he knew he had to follow those instructions. He said, cover the inside and the outside with pitch. Okay, God was very, very specific. He didn't say just cover the outside of the ark with pitch. He, cover, he said, cover the inside and and the outside with pitch. Now, do you think there was a reason God asked him to do that? Of course there was. Do you think it would have floated if he had not put pitch on the inside or the outside? Probably would have had created light leaks in the side of the ark if he hadn't done it on both sides. Because maybe what you missed on the outside, you covered on the inside. There was a reason God was very specific in his instructions. Um, and it shall be it, and this is how it shall be made. Uh, make you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits. The width five, uh, fifty cubits, and the height thirty cubits. Okay, God was very specific in his instructions on the height, width, and length of the ark to Noah. And so those are the instructions that he followed. You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it with a cubit for above, and it set the door in the side of the ark. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. So right there it shows that God gave instruction to Noah on how to build the ark. Now, I don't know that God gave him a 64-page manual or instruction manual, but he was very specific in his instructions on how to build the ark. Turn with me to Romans 12, verse 2. Romans 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may provide what is good and what is equitable and perfect will of God. Up world today. Things are changing daily, and we see that. I mean, just this week, there's been a lot of things that have changed in our world. It's not something we like to see, but it's something that takes place. Now, in our world, there are some instructions or laws that we have to follow. How many are here when you see the sign on the side of the road that says 55, actually drive 55. Raise your hand if you 
only drive 55 when you see that sign. You never go above. Just raise your hand if you, don't be afraid, because you know what? You're following instruction. And it's okay to follow instruction, but how many of you just drive 55? If you only drive 55 when you see that sign, raise your hand. Boy, we have lots of people that don't follow instruction here in this church, don't we? <laughs> well, that's quite all right, because I drove here this morning, and coming out of Marinette Menominee, there was a sign that said 65. So immediately I set my cruise at 70. Exactly. That's exactly what I did. Because I don't like to follow instruction. Do you like to follow instruction? Why should we follow those instructions? It's no fun to follow instructions unless we want something to turn out perfect, right? Then we want to follow instructions because we want it to look really good. But we, we struggle as humans to follow instruction. We had a social at our church uh, two weeks ago. We call it the birthday social. So we have 12 birthday cakes. We set them up in the gym. And the instructions are you have to sit at your birthday month. So you may not sit with your wife. You may not sit with your mom and dad. You have to sit at the month you were born. But before we started the little social, we handed out papers. So everybody was in the hallway because we didn't want them to see the cakes until we opened the doors and everybody could come in. And we handed them the paper and there was some questions on there. We said, fill out these questions. On the back, we want you to go around and look at the cakes and choose your three most favorite cakes. One, two, and three. Because we're doing a cake judging because they're all decorated. And then, when we call you to sit at the table, we'll pick up the paper. Pretty easy instructions, right? Well, guess what? Nobody listened. <laughs> they brought the papers back to me. I said, that's not what I asked you to do. I said, I would come around and pick the papers up. But I didn't get mad. I didn't get upset. I just took them as they came in. But it went along great with the sermon I preached the next week about following instruction. We did have about four people that followed instruction. And when I went around to the table, I picked up four pieces of paper out of the 70, 60 that were there. I picked up four of them. So I have four people that follow instructions to the T in Wilson. The rest of us don't like to follow instruction. But we're, we're we're asked to follow instructions throughout our lives. I mean, back to the car thing and driving. How many of you turn on your blinker when you're going to turn left or turn right? How many? Most people do that. I was driving in town the other day. I'm going along the same speed as the guy in front of me, and all of a sudden he decides to turn with no blinker. What do you think that did to me? It put me in a precarious situation because now I had to apply my brakes quite hard on icy roads because he never warned me he was turning. Never turned his blinker on. So he didn't follow the instruction manual or what you're supposed to do when you took driver's ed and you were making a right hand turn. He didn't turn his blinker on. He just turned. And I was not far behind him. So there's reasons that we have these laws and instructions through our life. Now, <clears throat> I know that you guys have a school close by that you have uh, probably some, uh, some help that you give them and some instruction that you give them. Back in Wilson, we have a school, Wilson Junior Academy. And we have an instruction manual. It's called a handbook, but really, what's a, what's a handbook? It's an instruction manual. And in this handbook, it tells us what our kids should wear, if they should chew or not chew gum in school. It tells us what the telephone usage is. So a, kid can't, uh, a student can't just go in and grab the phone and use it. They have to uh, ask the teacher and they have to tell the teacher who they're calling and why they're calling that person. 
So these are, these are the instructions in here, and, and parents should read these. If you have a child in this school, you should read this instruction manual because somebody put this together to help you know what to do when you're at that school. So we have an instruction manual for our school. I teach the uh, primary class at Wilson, and at the end of class, I have instructed our students, because we have sometimes 15, sometimes we have six, but um, we sing songs and we have uh, a book that we use, and so typically once we're done singing, they set the book beside their chair. But before they leave Sabbath school, I always say, take the songbook, face the words towards the window, and put them back on your chair. It's instruction. I have to remind them every Sabbath to do that. But you know what? They do it without questioning me. Why do you think I ask them to do that? Do you have anybody that comes and cleans this church? Yeah, we have people that clean our church. It's usually church members. I think it's quite nice to be able to go into the primary room and see that you don't have to pick up all those songbooks and put them back on the chair. It's already done for you. You know, I ask our kids, you know, just look around. If you dropped a piece of paper, pick it up, put it in the trash. Now, it makes life easier for the next person coming in who's cleaning. You pick up after yourself. And then the last instruction I give them before they leave, because I'm one of the elders of the church, and typically I have to quit Sabbath school pretty much right on time, because I have to be up front pretty quick, I have to use the bathroom before I go up front, so I need them to leave so I can leave and get to my church duties. And so I say, okay kids, you're out before the rest of the Sabbath schools. So everybody else is in Sabbath school. So as you go down the hallway, I need you to be quiet. I don't need you peeking in the windows of the other classrooms because that is a distraction. We don't want you primary students being a distraction because then as the teacher, I'm gonna get talked to. And I don't like to be talked to. So I said, just go down to the foyer and sit on the couches until your moms and dads do. And generally they're really good. They do that. They go down there and they all get together and sit on the couches. And, but I give them instructions for reasons, right? Instructions are given to us to help us through life, to help us get along with other people, to help us protect other people. That's what instruction is for. But as I said, we don't like following instruction, right? We're going to go 70 even though it says 65. It's just what we're going to do because we get there faster. I was excited to get here. That's why I went 70. So I was excited to be here with you this morning. So I have a good excuse. But one of the questions that I have, and I want you to think about this through the rest of the service. There's always a consequence or should be a consequence for not following instruction. What is the price you're willing to pay for not following instructions? If I was doing 65 this morning, or 70 this morning, but at 66 miles an hour, the Wisconsin State Policeman pulls me over and says, I'm giving you a $100 ticket for going 60." or 66 and a 65. Is that price high enough for me not to do it again? Maybe for me it's not. Maybe, maybe I would still drive 70. If, if I was doing 62 and he said $200 for going, I'm sorry, 67, $200 for two, two miles over 65. Is that now a high enough uh, uh, price for me to say, eh, I'm not going to go over the speed limit? Does it have to be 500? 
when, when, do we, when is the price high enough you have to pay to bring you back to following instructions? Okay? Just keep that in the back of your mind. Think about it. What's the price you're willing to pay to follow instruction? Turn to Proverbs 19.20 with me. Proverbs 19.20 Listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. Now as I look across this congregation, I see a lot of latter days. And that means elderly people. Okay? So, so this was instruction for you 50 years ago. Follow instructions for your latter days. Now, I have a couple of young people back here. They're sitting back there. You're sitting with Dad. Dad says, I don't know what your name is. Tiffany, I need you to wash the dishes. Are you going to follow Dad's instructions? Hopefully you do, but if you don't, is there a consequence for not following the instructions to wash the dishes? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's go without supper next time. Maybe it's you have to get out of bed because you were already in bed and you have to wash the dishes. Or maybe dad just takes the dirty dishes and puts them on your bed and said, here's the dirty dishes you didn't wash. And so there was a consequence. So if you listen to instruction right now from mom and dad or from grandma and grandpa or the elder of the church or the deacon of the church or the deaconess of the church, when they talk to you, it's going to help you as you get older. Okay? So we need to follow instructions. Turn to Hebrews 13, 17 with me. Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey those who rule over you, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. Oh, wait a second. So those that rule over us aren't just ruling over us because they like being rulers. Maybe. They're, they're watching out for our souls. Hmm, interesting. And uh, as those who must give account. Ooh, wait a minute. Now it's saying that those that rule over us are held accountable. Hmm. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Well, that's interesting to me, because I heard you guys talk this morning. Uh, the gentleman got up here and he talked about what? Nominating committee. All right, this verse goes right along with nominating committee because when you do nominating committee, you pick a head elder, correct? Do you know there's an instruction manual for every job you take in the church? That's what this is. This is the instruction manual. And there's even a spot in here that talks about the head elder what he should be, how he should be, what he should do, how he should do it. And if you go back to this verse in Hebrews, 
He's taking that position, I believe, out of love for this congregation. And he's going to be accountable. Do you want that accountability? Do you want to take the head elder position and be accountable for every person in this church? It's a pretty big responsibility. If you read Hebrews and you read the instruction manual here, and head elder, do you have one of these books? Or the head, you're not the head elder? Yo, you're the elder. Okay, head elder. Do you have one of these books? Every one of our elders has one of these books. It's called the Elder's Handbook. It gives us many suggestions. I have some stuff underlined in this one. It tells us how to deal, deal with situations that come up in our church family and in our congregation. It tells us how we should pray. Uh, it, it's just a, it's an instruction manual. The elder and the church n nurture. You know, elders are supposed to nurture the church. Um, this isn't just for the head elder. Like I said, every one of our elders has one. Uh, it's, it's our instruction manual, and we need to follow it and read it. But Hebrews 13 says those that are in charge, you know, are supposed to be doing it out of joy. And if we're always getting grief and frustrations from those that are under us, it's kind of hard to keep that position. So as you go into nominating and you're nominating people for these positions, remember they're going to be your instructors. So you have to support them, right? I uh, started thinking about this talk, his sermon, came out of a primary Sabbath school lesson. It's funny how when you are asked to preach, you're asked to get up front, how God puts things into your mind to have you think about a sermon. And as I'm teaching my primary students one Sabbath about the Passover, he just put it in my mind that this is a sermon you need to preach. And it was really interesting because you can go so many different ways with a sermon. But this was on instruction. And as I look around the world around us, and I, I said this earlier, you know, it's, it's just crazy what's taking place right now these days. And over the past two years and what our world has changed. I found in Luke 17, 20 to 26, that the days and times were not much different than in Noah and Lot's time. It was a crazy world back then, too. So, uh, you know, things, things have changed, but, you know, they had this same problem back in Bible times. But it specifically brought me to the story of the Israelites because of the Passover. And I want you to turn to Exodus 12 with me. Exodus 12. And we're going to start right at the first verse in Exodus 12 because it says, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. Okay, so this is God coming right to Moses and right to Aaron, giving them instruction. Now, what was going on in Egypt at this time? The Israelites were slaves, right? And God wanted his people to be set free. Now, before chapter 12, we go through a series of plagues. But now we come down to the point where Pharaoh has denied their freedom multiple times, and God says, okay, it's time. 
It's time for Pharaoh to, to listen. So he goes to Moses and Aaron, and he gives them instructions. The month shall be your beginning of the month. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel. So speak to the whole church of Lena, all right? Every member in Lena needs to hear this. That's what they're saying about Israel. You have to go to every Israelite and let them know. On the 10th of the month, every man shall take himself a lamb according to the house of his father and a lamb for a household. So here's the instructions, okay? Every household needs to get a lamb. Your lamb should be without blemish, a male of the first year. You think that's really important? Why do you think it's so important? Why do you think it's so important that it had to be a lamb, first year, and a male? That was the instruction from God. Are we going to listen to God's instruction? We should. We should. Definitely we should. And we're going to find out what happens if you don't listen to God's instruction, at least in this story. Now you should keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Now, did that mean I could kill it at one time and you could kill it at another? God's asking us to do it all at the same time. And they shall take some of the blood and put on the two doorposts and on the lentil of the house where they eat it. All right, so here's instructions. We have to put some blood here. We have to put some blood here. We have to put some blood here. Is that important? It's just blood. Why is it important? Because it was God's instruction. That's right. It's God's instruction. Remember I asked you, what price is worth following instruction? Let's continue on. Now, not only were you supposed to put it on the doorpost, but you were supposed to put it on with a hessop branch. Not a cedar branch, not an olive branch, but a hessop branch. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in a fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Sounds like a good meal, huh? Bitter herbs. Anybody like bitter herbs? Huh? He's asking us to eat it with bitter herbs. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roast it in a fire, its heads with its legs and its internals. Pretty specific instructions, isn't it? From God. If you shall let none of it you shall let none of it remain until morning. And what remains until morning shall be burned with fire. So in other words, by morning it needs to be gone. <clears throat> and thus you shall, um, yeah, and thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, sandals on your feet, and your staff in hand, so that you shall eat it in haste. It is the Passover of 
is the Lord's Passover. Why did you have to eat it with your staff in hand, a waist, your belt on your waist, and sandals on your feet? Because it was God's instructions. But what was going to happen through the night? We know the story. We know the story. The angel of death was coming through Egypt. And what was going to happen if you didn't have blood on the doorpost, and not just the blood on the doorpost, but you hadn't killed the goat or the lamb, because earlier on, if you read, it says you could have a goat or a lamb. What if it wasn't a first year? What if it was not without blemish? Okay, so we put the blood on the doorpost, but we took a third year lamb because it was not such a nice lamb and we didn't want to use our first year lamb. What was going to happen? Your firstborn would die. Your firstborn would die. What price is high enough to follow instructions? Is it worth Taking a third year lamb to maybe lose your son or daughter who's your firstborn? And do you know it wasn't only a firstborn child you were going to lose? It was every firstborn animal that you owned. So the stakes are pretty high by not following the instructions, right? I see dad sitting back here with his children. If God came to you and said, follow these instructions, or tonight you're going to lose your firstborn, which I assume is the young lady sitting next to you, how, how far would you follow the instructions? All the way. Because you love her. You don't want to lose your firstborn. What is the price that you'd pay to not follow instructions? Now, God has given instructions throughout the Bible. And, you know, I talked about the world, and we follow instructions of the world. And as I was driving here this morning, it's not even in my notes, but I thought of Nebuchadnezzar. Made a statue, and he said, you need to bow down to it. And there were three young men that wouldn't. Was it good for them men not to bow down to it? Absolutely, because they were following the will of God, not the world. So we have to watch. Yes, we have to follow the instructions of the world. We have to listen to the speed limit or the officer. But there does come a point when we have to follow the will of God, which I read a couple of verses here. If you go back and you wrote them down, you'll see, follow the will of God. Because who's the one that's the almighty instructor? God. God. God gives us instruction. Now, he gives us the Ten Commandments. Are we to follow those today? Now, I'll say this for myself. Have I ever broken a ten, one of the Ten Commandments? Oh, I, I surely have. The nice thing is, Jesus came and died on the cross, and at that point gives us grace if we ask for forgiveness. Now this morning as I was driving here, if I was doing 75 and the 65, and the police officer pulled me over and I said, oh, please give me grace, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Would he have given me grace? Possibly. I could have said, oh, I'm late for preaching at Lena, I need to get there. He may have said, this morning I'll give you grace. I'll let you off with a warning. But if I see your name come up the next time, guess what? There's no grace. But there's this story that intrigued me of the Israelites. There was absolutely no grace. You follow my instructions or you will lose your firstborn. God was not saying, I'm going to give you grace. This is what needs to happen to go to the promised land. 
Where is our promised land? Heaven. Heaven. Does he give us specific instructions on how to get to the promised land? Yes. Here's our instruction manual. Are we reading the instruction manual? We know there's grace, but what's the price you're willing to pay to not follow the instruction manual? Is it not getting to heaven? I've lost a brother and a mother. My brother was 20 years old. My mother was 43 years old. The worst birthday I ever had was when I turned 43 years old because I knew I lived longer than my mother did. It was my hardest birthday ever. Some people say it's 50. Some people say it's 40. Mine was my 43rd birthday because I realized it's when my mother died and I said, oh my goodness, she was young. But I, I look at this story, and what's the price that I'm willing to give to never see them again? I need to follow the instruction manual. I want to see them again. I want to be with them in heaven. I want to be with Jesus who died for my sins on the cross in heaven. I have an instruction manual that tells me how to get there. I don't know about you, but I want to be there. As the world around us seems to be going south, our standards, our morals, our obedience, our disobedience, our disrespect, and the list goes on and on. We live in a, we live in a troubled world. Now, we have wonderful people in this world too. But the news wants us to just see the bad. I believe it's a time for us to follow the one and only instruction manual that matters. And as I showed you already, it's this one. It's the Bible. Isaiah 48 says, The grass withers, the flowers fade, but God's, but the word of God will stand forever. Let me say that again. Grass withers. We see it here in the north. Winter comes and the grass is not green anymore. Until the snow is gone, the sun warms it up, and it becomes green again. Flowers wither. It was Valentine's a couple weeks ago. Who got flowers? Well, hey, my wife got them. <laughs> Whew, lucky me. <laughs> I, I did my job. If you got flowers for Valentine's Day, do you still have them today? Yeah, all of them? No, no. Because they withered. They withered. Yep. But the word of our God will stand forever. It's never going to go away. No matter how bad some government officials want it gone, it will never fade away. It'll never be gone. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus is the same Yesterday and today and forever. He's never going to change. Turn to Joshua with me. And turn to Joshua 22. Five. Joshua twenty two five. But take what? Take my Bible says careful. Heed to the 
commandment. And the law which Moses, the servant of God, commanded you. To love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways. And I like to put instruction right here. In all his ways and his instructions. To keep his commandments, to hold fast to him, to serve him with all your heart and all your soul. What's the price we're willing to pay to not follow the instructions? I hope to see each and every one of you in heaven. And if I do, you'll know I followed the instruction manual, and I'll know you followed the instruction manual. Because I believe, like the Israelites, there's grace, but God is serious. He wants you to follow his instruction manual. And not just part of it, all of it. Amen. May the Lord bless you today. And we'll sing our closing song. surrender